I am so blessed to invite somebody up today. I'm so glad that, that God has blessed all of us at 412 Marietta to hear from one of the administrative pastors at Harvest Riverside. Please help me welcome up Pastor Brad Ormonde. Oh, so kind. Well, thank you all so much for allowing me to be here today. And, and uh, I take it very seriously when I come to someone else's pulpit and, and appreciate Pastor Tim and Nikki and everybody just being so warm and welcome. I was actually FaceTiming with uh, Tim just a bit ago. It's amazing that we can be here in Murrieta and, and he's in Israel and we're FaceTiming together. And Nikki was so kind to, to bring him over to me and pray for him. He's sick. And so we want to make sure that you guys continue to pray for him, especially during this uh, upcoming you know, Easter season. This gets so busy at churches. And so continue to pray for him. Very much appreciate all the pastoral staff here as well. Pastor Brian, Pastor Taylor, and you know, Simon being elder, just, just so grateful for the hospitality that's been shown to me. Also wanted to uh, welcome all the online audience on to the service this morning. Bless you as well as you study God's word with us together. Well, um, one of the things that um, I haven't, or you know, as far as our pastor, our pastor is, uh, my pastor is Greg Laurie out of Riverside. And uh, there are several things that Pastor Tim and Pastor Greg have in common. Uh, one is they use the same hairstylist. And, but uh, secondly, most importantly, they're very well respected in their churches. And uh, the, the third thing is they both love teaching the Word of God without apology. And so it's great to, to be here with you this morning. It is amazing to think that we only have uh, two more weeks until Easter. And it's just right around the corner. Time to bring people. Time to invite. Uh, you know, I've heard them called CEO Christians. Uh, Christmas and Easter only. And uh, so they're, they're ready. Hey, Easter's the time to go to church. We're going to church. So invite them to come. A great time to be, uh, have in, in God's word. And next Sunday is actually the start of what is called Passion Week. Passion Week. And you think, why is it called Passion Week? Well, it was the passion of Jesus and his resolve to go to the cross to die for the sins of humanity. And he took on such a passionate role in, in a hard flint to go to the cross. He willingly went there. And the next Sunday is what we call Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday is when, uh, I'm sure Pastor Tim and the team went, went there, uh, this trip is, is down the Via Della Rosa. And, and then through the, uh, the triumphal entry, you have um, where they would, would uh, lay down palm branches as the, the Jesus was coming into town uh, from uh, the outskirts areas. And he's coming into Jerusalem like he did so many times. But this time, in the triumphal entry, coming on the back of a donkey, they were wanting to make Jesus their king. Uh, the Roman rule was so hard on the Jewish people, and they think, we need a break from this. And they're thinking, Jesus is that guy. Uh, he's a good candidate. Uh, we're campaigning for him. We're laying down palm branches. They're, they're crying out, Hosanna, save now. Uh, they wanted to be a, a, away from the, the Roman rule. But Jesus didn't come to save them from the Roman rule. Jesus came to save them from their sins. And so it was unfortunate that, that the same crowd that prayed, Hosanna, save now, some of those folks would be saying just a few days later, crucify him. And that's the Passion Week and leading up to Easter. But this morning, I would like to take us a little bit further down the path or, or before the time of the Passion, before the time of, of the, the triumphal entry, before the, the cross, before the resurrection, and just in a time of space that Jesus is making his way towards Jerusalem for that week. We might all remember what happened during Passion Week, of course, with dying on the cross, the resurrection, uh, all up to that point. But maybe we don't understand or know what happened just before that point. That's what I'd like to discuss here this morning. We're going to look at three individuals, three individual stories on the way to the cross. We'll be in two passages of Scripture. Both will be Gospels. We'll be in the Gospel of Mark and right next door to it, the Gospel of Luke. So we'll use those two together. Uh, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were written to four different audiences. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew was written uh, and geared towards mostly those who were Jewish people. And Matthew was writing to that audience. Uh, Mark was writing more to a Gentile audience, talking to, to those who were not of Jewish descent. Uh, Luke was speaking more of, to the Greek audience. And then the Gospel of John it was written to really all audiences. And so we see the, all those together. So we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 10 and Luke chapter 19. The title of the message this morning, if you're taking notes, is On the Way to the Cross. On the Way to the Cross. 
I've been listening to uh, Pastor Tim's messages uh, on your current si series, Win, Disciple, Send. Uh, I know it's even your mission statement of your church. It's behind me here, Win, Disciples, Send. It's a very important aspect of what we do as Christians. And I think what we're going to discuss this morning really ties into that mission statement of Win, Disciple, and Send. I heard a story of a, a fifth grade teacher who was gearing up towards the Easter break, wanted to do something kind of fun with her class. And so she said, what we're going to do is we're going to have you stand up, say your name, tell us what one of your parents does for a living, for a profession, and what that, uh, spell that word, and then tell us what, they, what that means. So Jill, why don't you start? Hi, my name is Jill, and my dad is a builder. B-U-I-L-D-E-R. And he builds homes for a living. Great. Bobby, why don't you get up now? My name is Bobby, and my mom is a pharmacist. F-A-R, no, P-F-A, uh, Bobby, why don't you come back uh, tomorrow, go home, learn how to, how to spell it, and then we'll try it again tomorrow. Joey, you're up. My name is Joey, and my old man is a bookie. B-O-O-K-I-E. And if he were here right now, he'd give you 10 to 1 odds that Bobby won't be able to come back tomorrow spelling pharmacist. <laughs> well, Joey didn't have much confidence in Bobby's spelling. But we can certainly have confidence in God's word every day. And that's where we're going to go this morning. In the text we're going to be looking at, Jesus has prayed over, he's chosen, he's taught his disciples for three and a half years, all the time of his ministry. And one of the most difficult lessons of Jesus' disciples needed, they needed to learn was stop being so self-seeking and instead begin to serve others. That's what some of Christ's disciples still need to learn today. On many occasions, Jesus taught his examples to be, his disciples to be humble servants. Though his, it was through his teaching, but not only his teaching, it was his example. But they kept failing to grasp the point. And as the saying goes, everyone is willing to be a servant until they're treated like one. One of the very last acts of Jesus to the disciples, even of the three and a half years of hands-on ministry, was in the upper room washing the disciples' feet. And you know who was in that group as well? Judas Iscariot, who would later betray him. But yet still Jesus served them. So now what we're doing is we're going to be going to Jerusalem so we can enter into Passion Week. And Jesus and his disciples are coming down from a city known as Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is in the northernmost part of Israel. And uh, it was there where uh, Jesus asked the question, who do people say that I am? And the disciples answered, they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah. And then Jesus asked them an important question, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said some, you know, of course, Peter's always the first one to blurt something out. But he did a great job this time. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Good job, Peter. <laughs> but now we see that as we're heading down into the area, through Galilee, through Jericho, into Jerusalem, Jesus himself had been into the holy city of Jerusalem many times. Uh, we remember early on in his, in his age, when he was 12 years old, he was there at the temple talking to the, the rabbis. Uh, so he spent many time there in his, in his ministry there as well. A lot of time in Jerusalem because it was the, the, the capital of the religious uh, form that was going on in that day. And, but yet we see now that he was heading there one last time. And that was to fill, fulfill the very purpose to which he came, and that was to give his life a ransom for many. So during the next few months of travel, Jesus continued to speak to them about his impending suffering, his impending death, the resurrection, and that they needed to surrender to personal ambitions and aspirations. But unfortunately, they seemed to be more concerned about pursuing their own greatness and glory, as they still saw Jesus as a conquering king than a suffering savior. And as Jesus and the disciples make their way towards Jerusalem, we'll pick up the story in verse 32 of Mark chapter 10 when we read this. Now they were on the road going to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed. 
And as they followed, they were afraid. Then Jesus took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. And Jesus says in verse 33, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, they will scourge him, and they'll spit on him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. Would you please pray with me? Father, as we have entered this holy place, we ask that you would be our teacher here this morning. God, I am desperately dependent upon you to teach through me today. We pray, Holy Spirit, that we would have ears to hear what you have to say to us through your word. My desire here today is to make much of Jesus, to, to glorify you and edify the saints. So bless your word. Open it to our hearts now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it was in Caesarea Philippi where Jesus first made the exclamation to the disciples that he was going to die uh, for the sins of humanity. It was The first time was there, and then he continued on in his ministry and kept telling them about his impending death. But the disciples didn't quite understand that concept. We can understand the concept because we look at the pages of Scripture, we read the whole story. But they're right in the middle of it. It's like, Jesus is our best friend. This has been great. We're seeing healings. We're seeing all these things going on. For three and a half years, they came very close with Jesus. Even at one point in John chapter 14, Jesus was telling them of his impending death. And they became so bummed out. And Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also in the way you know. I love Thomas. He says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus continually taught this principle. Now, the verses that we've just read moves us forward, and this marks the third time now that Jesus tells his disciples in clear terms what was awaiting for him in Jerusalem. Not only does Jesus give us the exact details, he gives us the exact order in which they're going to happen. First, he said they would go up to Jerusalem. If you were traveling from here to San Diego, you would say we're going down to San Diego because you're heading south. If you're going to go from where I live up in Riverside, you'd say we're heading up to Riverside because we're going north. But anytime you go to Jerusalem, you're always going up to Jerusalem. If you're in the north or the south, you're always going up to Jerusalem because it was 2,500 feet above sea level, but more importantly, it's where the temple was. It was the Temple Mount, Mount Zion, where they would go up to worship. So it would be always going up. Secondly, Jesus said he would be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. This talks about Judas's betrayal in the garden of Gethsemane where he was arrested. And then he says, they will condemn me to death. Speaking of the, the high priest in the Sanhedrin condemning Jesus at his illegal trial. They in turn delivered him to the Gentiles referring to Pontius Pilate and the Romans. Jesus was mocked. He was scourged by the Roman soldiers. The abuse of the soldiers included spitting on him and they would kill him by means of of crucifixion. But on the third day, Easter, Resurrection Day, Jesus would rise again. So exact details given in the exact order before they even happened. In verse 32, we read that the disciples were two things. They were amazed and they were afraid, which is understandable. But what's not so easy to understand is their response to this, to the suffering and the death of Jesus, picks up in verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. James and John were part of the inner circle of Jesus' friends. There was Peter, James, and John. We read that many times in the Gospels. Peter, James, and John went and do this. Peter, James, and John was there with Jesus. At the Mount of Transfiguration, it was Peter, James, and John. At the Garden of Gethsemane, it was there with Jesus, Peter, James, and John. They were in the inner circle. Yes, all the 12 were there together, but Jesus chose them, those three, to be part of that inner circle. Uh, but here, two of those guys, James and John, it's amazing. Jesus is telling them, listen, guys, here's the deal. I'm going to the cross. I'm going to die for the sins of humanity. I'm going to rise again on the third day. 
and they're like, oh, wow, really? Um, hey, by the way, can you do something for us? It's like, this is really odd that they would do this. I, I want to pause here because their, init their initial response is, is nothing less than shocking. It would be like, you're in the hospital, and you're with your best friend. And the doctor comes in and says, I'm sorry, but you only have two days to live. He leaves, and your best friend says, wow, can I have your golf clubs? <laughs> or for you ladies, hey, can I have your really nice purse? You know, it's like, what? The doctor just told me I'm going to die, and you're asking me for things? This is what was happening with James and John. But I love the fact that Jesus, he's just so patient with us, isn't he? He just condescends to their selfish behavior and asks them, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Verse 37, they said to him, Grant to us that we may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptize, baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and my left hand is not mine to give, but is for those to whom it's prepared. And when the other ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know those that are considered rulers over the Gentiles, lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. So their response was, we want you to grant to us. We want to be with you on your right hand and on your left hand. Places of power, places of authority. That's what we want, Jesus. And Jesus hits the nail on the head when he replies, you don't know what you're asking for. You don't know what you're asking for. It was interesting that the sons of thunder are asking the Son of God to have the best seats right next to him in the throne. And Jesus asked them, are you able to endure what I'm about to endure? Oh, yeah, we're able to do that, no problem. Well, if that were the case, where were they at the cross? We don't see them anywhere near there. In verse 41, it wasn't just James and John who lacked humility. It was the rest of the disciples. They were greatly displeased when they heard what was going on. It says that as James and John made that request, the other ten were like, hey, we're not happy about that. Was it because James and John asked for that and they thought, that's pretty, you know, presumptuous of them. I think maybe they were displeased because they didn't ask first. Like, oh, man, we missed our chance. I wish we would have asked first, then maybe we could have been there too. You know, there's a vast difference between wanting to accomplish great things for the kingdom as opposed to simply wanting to be great. I have three things I'd like to, you to make note of here this morning, here in this passage. It, it really applies to us in ministry service to the church and discipleship. I have appreciated so much, again, the, the, the volunteers that are here uh, serving, you know, the, the church here. You've got, you know, Ed on the soundboard. You've got, you know, Taylor helping out with uh, the graphics. You've got Lance doing the, the songs. You've got Dan doing the video. We've got all these people helping out here. What a blessing that we all get to serve together for the purpose of glorifying God and identifying the body of Christ. So first off, Jesus responds in verses 38 and 39. He explains to his disciples and to us that ministry and discipleship require sacrifice and self-denial. It requires sacrifice and self-denial. You see, James and John, they sidestepped the emphasis of the cross and instead spoke about wanting to reserve their seats in heaven. But even Jesus couldn't receive a crown without first enduring the cross. Jesus took up the cross, and he tells each and every one of us to do the same. When he says, deny yourselves, take up the cross, and follow his example. Secondly, Jesus explains to them and to us that ministry and discipleship requires humility. It requires humility. In the world, the more authority that you have, the more money you make, the more people you supervise, supposedly indicates how important you are. But Jesus is reminding us here that those who are great in God's kingdom are those who are willing to serve, which is clearly the opposite of how the world sees it. J.C. Ryle wrote this, quote, The world's idea of greatness is to rule, 
but Christian greatness consists in serving. Thirdly then, in verse 45, Jesus explains to his disciples and to us that ministry and discipleship requires obeying Jesus. It requires obeying Jesus. He was the supreme example of serving. He did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Over in Luke chapter 22, Jesus says, I am among you as the one who serves. Again, in the upper room, it was Jesus who, who laid aside his garment, girded himself with a towel, and began to wash the disciples' feet just before they ate the Passover meal leading up to the cross. And that was the role of a servant to do that, not the Son of God, not God himself. Afterwards, explaining to them what he'd done, Jesus said, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Again, I hope that you are serving in some capacity here at, at 412 Church because it's so needed uh, here at the church. And, and if you want to be able to get involved afterwards, come up and talk to the pastors and elders and let them tell you what the things that they need. Because, you know what, the, the carpets don't vacuum themselves. Uh, you know, the, the, a lot of the elements that happen here at church don't happen just because they happen by osmosis. People are doing some of those things. And I can tell you this, serving is a blessing. That's why Jesus said in Acts, it's better to, to give than receive. And when we serve, we serve with the attitude of serving Jesus. We're not serving Pastor Tim. He gets blessed by it. We're not serving Pastor Brian or Pastor Taylor. They love it, but we're serving Jesus when we do those things. The ultimate example of Jesus was that he veiled his deity and he came to the earth as a servant in the clothing of humanity. The world wants us to believe that joy and success comes from others serving us. But true joy comes from us serving others in the name of the Lord. As, as Scottish preacher Andrew Bonner put it, love is the motive for working. Joy is the strength in that working. And Jesus, again, he said, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you're doing it unto me. So how we treat and respond to others is a reflection of how we treat and respond to Jesus. So now Jesus and his disciples are continuing on in their journey towards the way to the cross, and they come to the city of Jericho. Let's continue on the way to the cross with our second story. We'll read in verse 46. Now they came to Jericho, and as Jesus went out of Jericho with his disciples in a great multitude, a blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was coming by, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him, be quiet. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, hey, be, give, be of good cheer, rise, he's calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I might receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. We'll stop there. Along the road where Bartimaeus was begging, he heard that Jesus was passing by. What a timely thing for him. And so he began to cry out, I heard about Jesus, I heard about him healing. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the other people are like, be quiet. We want to hear what Jesus has to say. Now, I'm not going to be quiet. This might be my only opportunity for Jesus. Jesus, have mercy on me. Sensing his genuine faith, Jesus stopped walking. He called for Bartimaeus to be led to him. And then the crowd changed their tune a little bit. They said, hey, he's calling for you. Go, go up there. And Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus replied, Rabboni, that I might receive my sight. Again, pause with me for just a moment and notice that this is now the second time in a few verses Jesus is asking someone, what do you want me to do for you? Back in verse 36, Jesus asked his two ambitious disciples, what do you want me to do for you? And their request was for a promotion. James and John wanted glory. But Bartimaeus simply wanted grace. I wonder if Jesus looked over at James and John as he asked Bartimaeus. He's like, he's there with Bartimaeus, and what do you want me to do for you? Looking over at James and John, 
Watch, check out this answer. I just want to be healed of my blindness. Great answer. And James and John are probably looking at each other, man, man, we blew that last one. But we just love the fact that Jesus is so willing to touch people's life. James and John wanted to be seen. This poor blind man wanted to see. The disciples were blinded by their own ambitions, and the contrast with Bartimaeus is very obvious. As one writer puts it, you'd have to be blind to miss it. Now, Bartimaeus, he addressed Jesus as Rabboni, which is interesting because it, it means both a teacher and a master. It's an affirma affirmation of faith. The only other person who used this term was at the cross, and the, actually at the resurrection, when the tomb was opened, and Mary ran to see if Jesus, where Jesus was, and there he was, and she grabbed hold of him and says, Rabboni, master, teacher. Now, the, in the Jewish religious schools, rab, the shortest form, meant master. Rabbi meant my master. And the highest form of the word, Rabboni, it means my Lord, my master. And that's the term that Bartimaeus used here for Jesus. Bartimaeus had received Christ for his salvation right then and there. And Jesus said to Bartimaeus, go your way, your faith has made you well. Literally in the Greek, Jesus said to him, your faith has saved you. So that day, Bartimaeus received his physical sight, but he also, and more importantly, received his spiritual sight. And the question is asked many times when we're talking about healing, does God still heal this way today? Will God still instantaneously, miraculously heal people? And the short answer to that is yes. God still heals people today, but there's also other ways of healing. When I pray with someone for a healing, and by the way, if you have a, a need of physical touch, come up after the service, and pastors and elders are here, they will pray with you. But when we have a physical ailment, it's okay to ask for prayer. We have not because we ask not. And so when people ask me to pray for them for healing, I'll pray this way. Lord, I pray that you would, you would uh, bless my brother or sister, that you would touch them, that you would heal them instantaneously, miraculously, like you did in the scriptures, whether it was someone touching you or you touching someone or you simply just speaking it into existence, and it happened. Folks, God still heals that way today. I've seen it. Have you seen it? Several of you have seen it, and God still heals that way. But he also heals through medicine and surgical procedures. And so I'd pray, nevertheless, Lord, not our will, but your will be done. If it's through a medicine or a surgical procedure, by all means, God, let that happen that way. And it was the Apostle Paul who prayed three times for his infirmity to leave him. We're not sure what that infirmity was, but he prayed, God, take this thing away from me. Three times he prayed it. God finally said, Paul, don't pray that prayer anymore. I'm not going to heal you. My grace, though, is sufficient for you. In your weakness, I'm made strong. And so sometimes God says, no, I'm not going to heal you from that thing. But, but he says, that's okay, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And so we know, though, the ultimate healing, though, happens when we get to heaven. Where there's no more pain, there's no more sorrow, there's no more suffering, there's no more sickness. And that's what we know. So, so God still heals today, instantaneously, uh, also through medicine or procedures. Sometimes my grace is sufficient for you, but ultimately God will heal us. So then we read that Bartimaeus followed Jesus on the road. When someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ... They don't just accept Jesus for their salvation and that's it. That's just the beginning. You know, we don't accept Jesus because we want fire insurance, right? We don't want to go to hell, so hey, I'm going to accept Jesus. I want to go to heaven. Um, there's more to it than that. It's the discipleship part of it. Again, it's the win, discipleship, send. And so for that, we know that, that Bartimaeus was now in that discipleship process. He was won by Jesus. Now he's following Jesus, a hopeless, blind beggar in need of God's mercy and forgiveness, who humbly responds by faith and then follows Jesus. Now we come to our third and final story on our way to the cross. Let's make our way over to the book of Luke. The Gospel of Luke is just one book over. And Jesus was coming now into the city of Jericho. And through the city, he wasn't finished ministering to people yet. Even though the ministry of Jesus touched down several times in and around Jericho, there's no indication he ever spent the night there. Jesus never stayed in Jericho, but he certainly ministered there. So on the way to the cross, Jesus did not bypass Jericho, but purposely went through it because there were people there that desperately needed him. People like Bartimaeus. And as you're turning there, I'd like to say I'm so glad that Jesus goes out of his way for us. 
Jesus went out of his way to secure your salvation. And so now we see, uh, we're going to pick up our story in, in chapter 19 of Luke, in verse 1. We read this. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, but he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but he couldn't because of the crowd, and for he was of short stature. He was just a little guy. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So Zacchaeus made haste, came down, and received Jesus joyfully. But when those around him, those religious leaders, when they saw it, they all complained and said, he's gone to be a guest with a man who was a sinner? Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, Look, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I'm going to restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is the son of Abraham. For, he wa- for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. You guys remember that story? Have you ever seen that song when you were in Sunday school? We're not going to sing that. I, I told uh, the worship team, we, I, we're not, we're not going to do that this time, Robert. But uh, you should have been here last time. We actually came up and sang, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. No, we didn't really do that. But, uh, but you know what? It's great that we can think about those things. And, but it wasn't just a cute little song that we sing. This really happened. And Zacchaeus, he's a businessman. He's a chief tax collector. He's not just a tax collector. He's a chief tax collector. He's a supervisor. So could you imagine this guy? He's wearing a suit. He's running down the street, and then he climbs up in a tree. Could you imagine some guy, some business guy, Monday morning, you see him walking, running down Jefferson in a suit, running as fast as he can. Then he gets to a tree and starts climbing it. You're thinking, this guy's got to be crazy. But he wanted to see Jesus. He'd heard so much about Jesus. And so now he wanted to see him. It's interesting that the story of Zacchaeus is only recorded in Luke's gospel. It's not recorded in any of their other gospels, which surprises me because Matthew was a tax collector. So you'd think, man, one of my buddies came to faith in Christ. I'm going to surely add this to my story, but he didn't. Interesting. But, you know, in verse 1, don't miss the deeper and broader meaning of these words. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Because what it does, it it quietly describes Jesus' mission and ministry. He left his throne in heaven to enter and pass through this world. At the same time, these should describe our attitudes about the world as well. Folks, can I tell you this? We're just passing through this world as well. I don't know what troubles you're dealing with today, but I can tell you this as a guarantee from God's word, they're temporary. I'm not sure how temporary They may be a day temporary, they may be a week, a month, a lifetime, but they are temporary because once we pass through this world, for those of us in Christ, we go to heaven. And so there, again, that's a great place that we all enjoy through Christ. Paul the Apostle reminds us in his epistle to the Philippians, he says, our citizenship, where we're really from, is in heaven. The author of Hebrews wrote that Abraham waited for the city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. And then John wrote, Do not love the world or the things in the world, for the world is passing away. In Jericho, there was a certain man. In verse 2, we are given his biography. Interesting, just with a, a few words, we're kind of told a lot about this guy. He was given the name Zacchaeus, which means pure and innocent, or righteous one. You know, there's a lot of times parents will name their children uh, based on, in this culture anyway, based on what they wanted them to be. And so they would name uh, Zacchaeus. they look at little Zacchaeus. Oh, you look so pure and innocent. You look like the righteous one. Those parents couldn't have been more wrong. You know, he's a chief tax collector. Now, I find it interesting that up in the platform, uh, we had three Brads up here. The drummer is Brad, the guitar player is Brad, and I am Brad. It was a Brad fest. I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> I wonder if Pastor Tim says, you know, I need, we need to get a pastor named Brad just to, to fit the motif of what's going on on the platform. But uh, I looked up my name just a few moments ago to see what it meant. I didn't really know what it meant. And it said, Brad is a, a, a small a wire with an asymmetrical head. <laughs> and then I looked up asymmetrical and it says the head doesn't fit the body. 
So I don't know what that means. I just want to say thanks, Mom and Dad. Um, but, you know, naming a child has a lot of meaning. I know that uh, Taylor and Katie are, are welcoming their new son Jackson here soon, any day now. That's exciting. And we come up with these great names. But for Zacchaeus, his name didn't fit who he became yet. Uh, but the second thing we learn about him is his profession. He was a chief tax collector. Now, a tax collector in these days are not like, like we think today, the IRS. You know, we think of the IRS, we think, ah, I'm going to get audited, you know. And we don't have a really good feeling about the IRS a lot of times. If you're an IRS worker, I'm sorry. That's just the way we feel. Uh, but you know what? Um, a tax collector was even worse than that because they were Jewish. They were commissioned by the Roman government to take taxes from the people to give back to the Roman government. But then anything they got above and beyond that went to themselves. So they would tax the people of the Roman tax, they and themselves taking it from their fellow Jew and taking it for the Roman government and for themselves. They were despised, to say the least. So he was not living up to his name. But it's interesting to see the changes that he has experienced that day, all because Jesus visited Jericho. And we see several transitions in the story. The first being that a man became a child. Again, it was, it was, in this culture, it was very odd for a man to run, especially a wealthy government official. Yet Zacchaeus ran down the street like a little boy going to the parade. Not only did he run down the street, then he climbed up a tree because Zacchaeus must have become curious. We see that Zacchaeus saw, why the big crowd? Who is this Jesus of Nazareth? Everyone's following him. What am I missing? Zacchaeus had a condition known as FOMO, F-O-M-O, fear of missing out. You ever been, I don't want to miss out. Zacchaeus didn't want to miss out. He couldn't see, so i, I got to climb a tree, see what this is all about. What was he missing out on? Jesus. And Jesus had just said in Luke 18 that whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter. You know what keeps some people from any, entering into the kingdom of God and seeking Jesus? Mostly pride. It becomes pride for them because it means, keeps many successful people out from trusting him. Another transition is a seeking man became found. A seeking man became found. Zacchaeus thought he was seeking out Jesus, but Jesus was seeking out Zacchaeus. By nature, we don't seek after Jesus. A lost sinner doesn't necessarily seek after Jesus. Jesus seeks after us. You know, when our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned in the garden there in Genesis, they hid themselves. And God had to find them. God knew where they were. You know, Adam, where are you? Uh, we're hiding. Uh, why are you hiding? Because we're naked. Who told you you were naked? Well, we ate the fruit and there we are. But God was seeking after them and he still forgave them. When Jesus was ministering on earth, he sought out the lost. And today, the Holy Spirit through the church is searching for lost sinners as well. Now, we're not told how God had worked in the heart of Zacchaeus to prepare him for this meeting with Jesus. Matthew, being a former tax collector, maybe he, he, he talked to his friend and said, hey, I, I, man, Jesus is, is, you know, he came to town. He saved my soul. I want you to meet him too. All of a sudden, he heard that Jesus is coming down. I don't know. We don't know what happened there. Had Zacchaeus become weary of his wealth, started yearning for something better? Wealth can only satisfy for so long. You know, the Bible talks about in Ecclesiastes that we're, we've all been placed with, with a God-shaped hole in our heart. And only one thing really truly fits that. Now, we try it with relationships, and it fits for a while. We try it with money, and it fits for a while. It feels good. Or new things, and it fits seemingly for a while. But only one thing truly fits forever, and that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. We don't know for sure, but we can rejoice that a seeking Savior will always find a sinner who is looking for a new beginning. Another transition is a small man became big. A small man became big. It was not Zacchaeus' fault that he was small of stature and couldn't see over the crowd, but he did what he could do to overcome this challenge by putting away his dignity and climbing up a tree. But you know what? All of us, in a spiritual sense, are small of stature. As Romans 3.23 tells us, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
No one measures up to God's high standards. We're all too small to enter heaven. The unfortunate thing is many lost sinners think they are big. They measure themselves by man's standards. Money, position, authority, popularity, things that are of no importance to God. They think they have everything when they really have nothing. Zacchaeus trusted Jesus Christ and became a, a true son of Abraham. In other words, a child of faith. Talk about a small man becoming big. Another transition we see in this text is a poor man becomes rich. Wait a minute, I thought you said Zacchaeus was wealthy. Yes, but the people thought Zacchaeus was a wealthy man. He thought of himself as a wealthy man, but actually he was a bankrupt sinner who needed to receive God's gift of eternal life. In the story before us, this is the only instance in the Gospels of Jesus inviting himself over to someone's home. And it illustrates the words of Revelation 3.20 when Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now Zacchaeus, once he was saved, he said, I'm going to do all these things for you now, Lord. Zacchaeus wasn't saved because of his good works. But because of his good works, then he would now, because of his salvation, he would be doing good works. As Ephesians tells us, by grace we are saved through faith, and that not of our own doing. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone could boast. Zacchaeus could not boast of anything of this grace. He's, his life change resulted in him paying off the highest price because his heart had truly been changed. All that money that I took from my, my brethren, I'm going to give back. And not only am I going to give back, I'm going to give back fourfold. So if he took $1,000 for someone, he was going to give them back $4,000. That's a changed heart. That's a changed life. And lastly, the host became the guest. Jesus invites himself to Zacchaeus' house, and Zacchaeus receives him joyfully. You know, joy is one of the, the key themes in the Gospel of Luke. And the word is found over 20 times in one form or another. And if you're saved here this morning... That experience alone should bring you joy. The experience of salvation should bring joy to the believer's heart. Now, let's not confuse joy with happiness. There's plenty of times that I'm not happy. When I'm driving on the 91 freeway near Riverside and the traffic's jammed up, I'm not happy. But I can still be joyful knowing that I'm saved and I won't have to deal with traffic in heaven. But there's a difference between joy and happiness. We can always have the joy of the Lord because it is our strength. Zacchaeus became the guest in his own house. For Jesus was now his master. He was ready to obey the Lord and do whatever was necessary to establish a genuine testimony before the people. Early in, the, in this chapter, Jesus was ridiculed for going into a tax collector's house, a sinner's house. Here, in the same way, the, the religious leaders are not happy. Doesn't he know he's a sinner? Yeah, that's why Jesus came, to save the lost. But here he goes in and salvation comes. So three different stories Three different circumstances, but the same God ministering to all of us the same exact way we need him to. James and John, they needed correction. Refocus their attention on Jesus and not themselves. Bartimaeus, he needed a physical healing. And Jesus knew he needed more than that. He needed a spiritual healing as well. Zacchaeus, he wanted a glimpse of Jesus. He got all of Jesus. He thought he was searching for him, but Jesus was searching for Zacchaeus. So in conclusion, this story ends with a great declaration that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Passing through Jericho that day, Jesus was on the way to the cross. And as it turns out, Bartimaeus, the blind beggar, and Zacchaeus, the, des the despised tax collector, were the last persons Jesus saved before he reached the cross. At the cross... The Roman centurion and the thief being crucified next to Jesus were both saved. But Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus were the last converts on the way to the cross. Bartimaeus called out to Jesus and Zacchaeus climbed up a tree to see him. And did, little did either realize that the Savior was actually looking for them. When a day begins, we never know how it's going to turn out. We don't know how the rest of this day is going to turn out for us, but God does. For Zacchaeus, that day ended in joyful fellowship with the Son of God. For now, he was a changed man with a new life. 
Jesus is still seeking the lost and yearning to save them, allow me to ask you a question this morning as we close. Has Jesus found you? Let's pray. Well, hey, I hope that message you just heard was a blessing to you. It was a challenge to you. It was encouragement to you. Most of all, I hope that if you are a person who has not given your life to Jesus, that this message just encourages you to do just that. It's very simple to do. All you have to do is believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you can say this prayer with me right now. Father in heaven, I confess to you today that I am a sinner Uh, Lord, that I have messed up in life. I haven't lived up to your very high standard, nor can I. And so I'm grateful for what I understand today. I understand that you sent your son, Jesus, to walk here on this earth, to live a life of perfection, to die a death on a cross, to go into the grave, but not just to stay there. He came out, he rose again, and I believe that today. I believe he sent his Holy Spirit. Lord, that as I believe in you today, your Holy Spirit will come upon me that you will take up residence within me, that you will give me the strength, you will give me the wisdom, you will give me the courage, you will give me the boldness, the faith, everything I need to live for you. And so I promise this day forward that my life will be a life spent trying to please you. I pray, Lord, that as I mess up, and I know I will, I pray that your grace and your mercy would be upon me and that you would give me the encouragement to move forward. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, if you just said that prayer, first of all, I want to welcome you to the family of God. I want you to know that angels in heaven are rejoicing, and we here at 412 Marietta want to rejoice with you. And the next thing you got to know is there's a step that goes beyond giving your life over to Jesus, that is the step called discipleship. And what this is, is the process that you begin to grow in this newfound faith of yours. And we don't want to leave you alone to do that by yourself. God has given his Holy Spirit to you to help you in that, and he brings other people around you. And so we here at 412 Marietta want to help you in that process. So come on out to the church. We'd love to give you the encouragement, give you the tools that you need in this newfound faith. And uh, we'd love to help you grow in your walk. And so come on out on Sundays, 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And if you do, come on out and say hello to me. I'd love to get to meet you and encourage you in your faith. God bless you. I love you.